For today's discussion, we will discuss the chapter 2 of our prelim, which is the Philippine condition during the 19th century. So, uh, alamin natin kung ano nga ba ang naging kalagayan at estado ng Pilipinas noong 19th century. Okay? Because during this time, uh, ito rin yung panahon na ipinanganak si Dr. Serizal noong 19th century. Now, when we say 19th century, uh, ito yung panahon mula 1800 to 1899. So, huwag kayong makakonfuse, okay? So, as we go on to our discussion, we will also discuss the, the uh, situation of the Philippines when it comes to its political, uh, sociocultural, uh, the economy, and its educational system. So, aalamin natin yung uh, estado ng political uh, aspect ng Pilipinas noong 19th century, kung paano ba yung pamumuno noong panahon ito, and of course, the sociocultural kung ano nga ba yung mga practices or yung mga uh, kultura na bin, uh, dinala ng mga Spaniards sa Pilipinas and of course the educational system uh, alamin natin kung ano nga ba yung mga pinag-aaralan ng mga estudyante noong panahon ito at kung ano nga ba yung mga uh, uh, way or yung teaching strategy ng mga teachers noon panahon ng mga ng Spaniards, okay, ng Spanish colonization, and of course the economy of the Philippines. We will discuss kung uh, naging malago ba or kung ano nga ba yung mga policies na ipinatupad ng Spaniards during this period. So if you are one of my students, I hope you are taking down notes para at least uh, madagdagan ang inyong kaalaman sa subject because yung mga lessons or mga content na inupload ko sa LMS ay nadagdagan, okay? Yung iba doon, hindi ko na nailagay. So, as much as possible, mag-take down notes kayo, okay? And, of course, I hope you will watch this video until the end. And, yeah! Hello, good afternoon everyone. Again, this is Sir Marvin. And for today's discussion, we will discuss the second chapter for prelim which is the Philippines in the 19th century as results context. So, pag-aaralan natin ngayon yung naging kalagayan at estado ng Pilipinas noong 19th century o noong panahong ipinanganak si Rizal. Now, when we say 19th century, ito yung taon mula 1800 hanggang 1899. Pag sinabi naman nating 18th century, that's between 1700 to 1799. Uh, sa 19th century, ipinanganak si Rizal. Ano nga ba ang kalagayan ng Pilipinas noong panahong ito? Our topics for this discussion covers the social structure, the political system, the educational system, and the economic development in the Philippines. Okay. Spain and the Philippines in Rizal's time. Spanish rule was imposed in the Philippines by conquest. So, sinakop tayo ng Espanyol uh, for 333 years. Sa pananakop nila, uh, they use two strategies. So, the first strategy was evangelization. Ito yung strategy na kung saan uh, pinapalaganap nila yung religion which is Christian. Christian uh, Catholicism. Okay? Christianismo sa Pilipinas. The second strategy was colonization. Kabaliktara naman ito nung evangelization. So dito, dinagamitan na dito ng lakas militar at dahas. Okay? So, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, he established the first Spanish settlement in 1565 in Cebu. Siya ang pinakaunang governor general sa Pilipinas and the last governor general is Diego de los Rios. Before the conquest, the Filipinos had their own indigenous culture and their own government, the barangay, headed by a native chieftain called Datu. So, uh, bawat barangay ay independent from uh, each other and uh, bawat isa sa kanila ay may sariling laws or batas. Bago dumating mga Spanyol at sakupi ng Pilipinas, ang mga tao noon marunong na silang magsulat at magbasa. So, basically, meron na rin silang mga... Uh, kasulatan or mga literature or uh, arts, ganyan. But when the Spaniards colonized our country, they forced the Filipino people to adopt foreign ways or practices. So, walang choice si mga Filipinos during that time but to accept uh, the culture and tradition practices of the Spaniards. Okay? 
So the Philippines became a colony of Spain and she belonged to the King of Spain. So simula nung sinakop tayo ng mga Spanyol hanggang 1821, ang bansa, ang bansa natin ay pinamumunuan ng uh, Viceroy of Mexico as the representative of the Spanish King. Okay, so indirectly tayong pinamumunuan ng Spain sa pamamagitan ng Viceroy of Mexico. Ngayon, noong nakalaya ng Mexico sa Spain noong uh, 1821, ang Pilipinas ay direkta ng pinamumunuan ng Espanya sa pamamagitan ng Governor General. Okay, so directly na tayong pinamumunuan noong lumaya ng Mexico sa Spain. Okay, now let's proceed to the political condition of the Philippines during the 19th century. The Spanish colonial government in the Philippines ran indirectly through the viceroy of the Spain in Mexico. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Philippines uh, was ruled by the viceroy of Mexico indirectly as a representative of the Spanish king. Okay, Since the Spanish monarchy was able to colonize the big part of the world, uh, ngayon, they uh, nag-assign ang... Uh, 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 Sp ang Spanish government ng officer na magmamonitor sa, sa mga colonies niya at saka sa, uh, sa mga nasakupan niya at ito ang Viceroy of Mexico. So, our system of government was divided into four. We have the national government, the provincial government, the municipal government, and the barrio or the uh, barangay government. Okay? Okay, so let's begin with the national government. Uh, the national government is headed by the Governor General. And si Governor General, uh, inappoint siya mismo ng Spanish King to be the representative in the governmental matters. So what are the responsibilities of the Governor General? First, he is the chief executive in the whole archipelago. And second, He is the head of state and church, so he exercised extent, uh, extensive powers as the head of the state and the church. Uh, third, uh, he is the commander-in-chief of the military, and um, he also had the power to give pardon for the prisoners and to decide in different issues in the country. And he also had the power of complace. So itong complace na to, ito ay exclusive power ng Governor General na kung saan mayroon siyang kakayahan na pagdesisyonan kung ang isang batas or ang uh, isang royal decree ay dapat bang ipatupad or hindi. So in our present time, ang katumbas ngayon ng Governor General is the President of the Philippines. Okay? Ngayon, uh, para masiguro ng King of Spain na walang ginagawang anomalya or pagmamalabis sa kapangyarihan ang Governor General, kailangan niya pa rin itong bantayan. So dito na papasok si yung visitador at saka yung residensya. So both of them will check and monitor the administration of the current Governor General. However, there is a difference between the two. So when we say visitador, it literally means to visit. Okay, The visitor will just visit a specific country to check the administration of the Governor General. While in residentia, okay, they are obliged to live in a, a certain country with the Governor General to observe him. So, uh, we can now conclude that there is, a st uh, there is still check and balance on the powers of different government officials. Okay? So now, let's proceed to the provincial government. Okay? So the provincial government is headed by the Alcalde Mayor or in our present time, ito yung provincial governor. Okay? The Alcalde Mayor is the head in the provincial level. He had the power and responsibilities like the Governor General, but its power was limited in the province. Okay, so pareho lang din yung power ng Alcalde Mayor si Governor General, limitado nga lang dun sa nasasakupan niya. Okay? Okay, now let's proceed uh, to the municipal government. So the municipal government is headed by the Gobernador Silio. Okay, so... His power and responsibilities was the same as the Governor General. However, his power was limited only in the town or pueblo. Okay? So, ang Gobernador Silio uh, 
meron siyang power na tinatawag nating indulto de comercio. So, ito yung power exclusively for the governor Silio to engage in trading. So, pwede siya makipagkalakalan sa ibang tao. Okay? So, yan ang duties and responsibilities ng governor Silio. Next, let's proceed to the barrio government. The barrio government is headed by the Cabeza de Barangay. He is the head of the barangay. Okay? And, ang governor Silio at Cabeza de Barangay, ito lang yung posisyon na maaring Uh, tanggapin at ibigay sa mga Pilipino during this period, okay? Ang pinakamataas na pwedeng posisyon ng isang Pilipino ay Gobernador Silio, okay? And, ayan, nasabi dito na ang Gobernador Silio at Cabeza de Barangay ay ibibigay lamang sa uh, Filipino male, dapat 23 years old siya, at may napag-aralan and meron siyang property of or meron siyang 500 pesos. Okay? Okay, now, let's proceed to the supremacy of the friars over the colonial government. The different religious orders had the great contribution in the establishment of a Spanish colonial government in the country. So, dahil malaki nga ang naging ambag ng religion sa Spanish colonial government, nangibabaw or nanaig yung tinatawag natin na Frilocracia sa Pilipinas. Ito yung pamumuno ng mga praile o ng mga pari sa government. Okay? So, the friars, uh, they could easily influence the governor general. In effect, they become the rulers of municipalities and they were able to control the different aspects of the society like uh, education, okay? the trading, the economy. Okay? So, ganun katindi yung uh, uh, kakayahan ng mga praile during this period. Okay? Even the governor general kaya nilang uh, kontrolin or diktahan. Okay? Now, the regular priests or uh, Spanish priests were able to dominate the control in different parishes and had the power to get the parishes from the secular or the Filipino priests. Okay, from this point of view, we can already uh, conclude that the superiority of the Spanish priests over the Filipino priests. Pag sinabi natin regular priests, sila yung mga Spanish priests, sila yung tinutukoy. At kapag secular priests naman yung sin ang binanggit, uh, it's sila yung mga Filipino priests or yung mga, mga pari natin. Okay? And because of the supremacy of the friars over the colonial government, uh, the enemy of the church will be considered as the enemy of the government as well, okay? So, kung sino yung uh, tinuturing na kaaway or kalaban ng church, uh, kaaway na din yun ng government, okay? And we can prove this by looking back on the case of Gomburza and Rizal, okay? Okay, now let's proceed to the abuses of the Spanish government officials. The excessive powers and privileges of the governor general made him weak and undisciplined. Okay. Now, because of the excessive powers and privileges given to the governor general, ito yung uh, nagbigay sa kanya ng opportunity para maging maluho at maging uh, abusive sa power niya. Okay. So, ang ginagawa niya, he give rewards and gifts to his relatives and closest friends. And the worst thing about this is that he penalize or pinaparusahan niya yung uh, mga taong hindi contento or hindi na kontento sa administration niya okay and from that the governor general oftentimes lack the moral strength to resist corruption so even the corruption hindi niya kaya malutasan okay and during this period hindi lang naman ang governor general ang corrupt uh, even other government officials corrupt din okay Next, the provincial government where the alcalde mayor was the administrator, an administrator, judge, military commander, was the most corrupt branch of the government. Okay, so, pag uh, tinanong kung sino ang most corrupt official, government official during this period, uh, the answer is the alcalde mayor. But when they, uh, when, uh, they ask, uh, what's the most corrupt official? Uh, branch of the government, uh, it's the provincial government, okay? Why? Why the alcalde mayor is the most uh, corrupt government official during this period? 
okay because the alcalde mayor controlled the provincial trade so itong si alcalde mayor ganito ang ginagawa niya bibilhin niya lahat ng produkto ng ng tao okay especially mga crops tulad ng rice sa murang halaga niya lang yun bibilin and then ibebenta niya ulit ito pero sa mas mataas na presyo na okay So, another reason is kinokolekta niya lahat ng produkto ng mga tao para makumpleto niya yung kinakailangan niyang kota. Kasi may, kail may kota sila na dapat mamit, okay? And kahit na walang ani, pinipilit niya pa rin yung mga farmers na magbigay sa kanya ng products nila. Okay? And the worst thing about this is that kapag uh, walang harvest or walang ibigay sa kanya na products, hindi niya bibigyan ngayon itong mga farmers ng mga seeds or yung mga pananim na itatanim nila sa susunod na hunting. Okay? Okay. Now, let's proceed to corrupt Spanish officials. Uh, if we're going to compare the administration and performance of the government, uh, of, uh, govern, government officials during 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, and 19th century, uh, the 19th century is, was uh, the worst, Okay? Where's uh, a century because uh, the officials, uh, colonial officials during that time were highly corrupt, incompetent, and cruel. Okay, so here are the notable corrupt and cruel, cruel government officials. Okay, let's begin with General Rafael de Izquierdo. Okay, from 1871 to 1873. Uh, si Izquierdo ang nagutos na ipapatay ang tatlong paring martyr or the Gomburza, okay? Kaya kinamumuhian siya ng mga Pilipino dahil siya yung nagutos na ipapatay yung tatlong pari, okay? Uh, next one, Admiral Jose Malcampo, okay? Uh, he is a good fighter, oo. Good fighter siya, unfortunately, he is incompetent for his position and he had a weak administration, Okay? Uh, next, si General Fernando Primo de Rivera. Okay? etong si Rivera, uh, ang ginagawa niya is tumatanggap siya ng suhol sa mga uh, mga pagsusugal. And ang kapalit nito ay pinapayagan niya na mag-operate lahat ng casinos sa Manila. So, ayun. Uh, more on ano siya, uh, suhol si de Rivera. Okay? Next, General Valeriano Whaler. Okay. Ang kwento naman itong si Whaler, okay? Nanirahan siya sa Pilipinas na mahirap siya. Pagdating niya ng Spain, bigla na lang siya umaman. So, uh, one-time billionaire si Whaler. Uh, the Filipinos scornfully called him tyrant. Why? It's because of his uh, brutal persecution of the Kalambatenan. So, yung Pinagpapatay niya lahat ng mga tenants sa Kalamba, particularly the family of uh, Dr. Jose Rizal, and the Cubans curse him as the butcher. Okay? Why? It's because of his ruthless uh, reconcentration policy during his governorship in Cuba, causing the death of thousands of Cubans. Okay? And the last one is General Camilo de Polavieja. Okay? So... Kilalang kilala to si Paula Vieira dahil siya yung uh, nagpapatay kay Dr. Jose Rizal, okay? Now, let's proceed to the Philippine representation in the Spanish Cortes. The first period of the Philippine representation in the Spanish Cortes from 1810 to 1813 was fruitful with beneficent results for the welfare of the colony. However, the second period of representation from 1820 to 1823 And the third period, 1834 to 1837, were less fruitful in parliamentary work. Okay. So, unfortunately, noong 1837, uh, the representation of the colonies in the Spanish Cortes was abolished. So, kabilang dito ang Pilipinas na walang tayo ng representative sa Spanish Cortes. Okay. So, anong naging epekto nito sa Pilipinas? Uh, naging malalang kondisyon ng Pilipinas during this time because wala tayong representative na supposedly magbibigay ng uh, feedback sa Spanish court or magbibigay ng mga hinaing or magsusumbong dun sa mga katiwalian, sa mga uh, uh, maladministration ng mga government officials sa ating bansa noong panahong, mga, noong 
19th century, okay? So, nawalan tayo ng uh, representative. And, ang mga Pilipino during that time, talagang nakiusap sila na magkaroon tayo ng representative sa Spanish Cortes. Ngunit, hindi tayo pinagbigyan ng Spain. And, the sad thing about this is that Cuba and Puerto Rico regained their right to have a representative to Spanish Cortes, but not the same with the Philippines. So, ang Cuba at Puerto Rico, pinagbigyan ang Pilipinas, hindi. Okay? Now, let's proceed to the social-cultural condition of the Philippines during the 19th century. Okay? The Spaniards imposed a new social stratification which discriminate the natives in their own land. So, during the 19th century, nagkaroon ng division of class or social stratification ng mga tao na naging dahilan kung bakit nagkaroon ng discrimination. Okay? So, at the highest level or the top level, andyan ang peninsulares, followed by insulares, third class, creoles, and the at the bottom level, uh, ang indios. Okay? So, ang peninsulares, sila yung pinakamataas na... Uh, class noong 19th century. Sila yung mga Spanish na ipinanganak sila sa Spain at tumira sila sa Pilipinas. So, ito yung mga mayayaman. Sila yung mga uh, mayayaman na pumunta sa Pilipinas para uh, magtayo ng business or uh, magkaroon ng posisyon sa government. Okay? Uh, sa insulares naman, sila yung mga Spanish na dito na sa Pilipinas ipinanganak. Okay? And then, the third class, of course, the Creoles, sila yung mixed blood. Combination sila ng Spanish at Filipino. So, andito na, under na dito yung ilustrado or the well-educated Filipino. And then, the principal yeah, or the landowners. And the last one, uh, the Indios, the last class, sila yung pinaka-unfortunate. Sila yung talagang nadidiscriminate sa society, okay? Uh, when it comes to uh, privileges in laws in the society, only the people belong to the highest class can enjoy this privilege. So, usually yung peninsulares at insulares lang yung nag enjoy sa mga rights noong 19th century. And the rest, halos discriminate na sila, okay? So, itong peninsulares at insulares, uh, they established their own community in Intramuros. And they will enclose it in a wall to segregate their populations from other class. Okay? So, Magkasama ang peninsulares at insulares sa Intramuros, okay? And then, uh, may barricade na kung saan sila-sila lang magkakasama, okay? Ayaw nilang ihalubilo yung uh, uh, sarili nila sa ibang uh, class, okay? And ang mga Creoles naman, sila naman yung unang nakaisip na tumuligsa at laban ng, ang mga Spanyol para magkaroon ng reforma. Of course, the Indios... Sila yung pinaka nadidiscriminate and sila yung pinagbabayad ng napakaraming taxes. Okay? Okay, now, let's proceed to the Frilocracy or Secularization of the Filipino Priest. Uh, Frilocracy or Frilocracia, the Spanish political philosophy of union of church and state. Before, meron tayong... Uh, uh, union of church and the state however uh, during this time or in our present time uh, there is a separation of church and the state okay the friars augustinians dominicans and franciscans controlled the religious and educational life of the philippines and later in the 19th century they came to acquire tremendous political power influences and riches okay so uh the colonial authorities, from the governor general down to the alcalde mayor, were under the control of the friars. So as we mentioned earlier, that, that even the, uh, the friars or mga pari, they can even control or influence the governor general. Ganun ka gatit, kat, katindi yung uh, kakayahan ng mga friars during uh, the 19th century, okay? So, almost every town in the archipelago, except in lands, was ruled by the friar. So, kontrolado nila lahat. Halos sila lahat ang may control sa Pilipinas, okay? So, aside from uh, priestly duties, the friar was the supervisor of the local elections, okay? That's number one. The inspector of schools and taxes, number two yan. Then, uh, 
the superintendent of public works okay and last one the guardian of peace and order okay so uh, aside from that a friar could also send a patriotic filipino to jail or denounce him as a filibustero so when we say filibustero it's a traitor okay traidor uh yeah he could send a patriotic filipino to jail or denounce him as filibustero to be exiled to a distant place, ipatapon sa napakalayong lugar, or to be executed as an enemy of God. Okay? So, si Jose Rizal, uh, Del Pilar, tapos si Haina, and other Filipino reformists denounced the friars as the enemies of liberal reforms and modern progress in the Philippines. Okay? So, even our national heroes uh, considered the friars as their enemy. Okay? Now, let's proceed to the educational system during the Spanish regime. Okay, the religion is still the center of the educational system imposed by the Spaniards. Okay, okay. the primary education is usually catered by the friars. So, the young uh, Filipinos will learn the Christian doctrine, alphabet language, customs, and practices. Okay. So, sa curriculum noon ng uh, school, hindi pwedeng mawala ang subject na religion dahil yan yung pinaka-importante sa kanila, okay? Ang palaganapin, ang Christianismo sa Pilipinas, okay? Girls and boys have separate schools and they also have different curriculums, okay? So, for male and secondary education, ito yung mga school for secondary education para lang sa mga lalaki. Colegio Maximo de San Ignacio, founded in 1589, College of San Idelfonso, founded in 1599. Ateneo de Municipal, founded in 1817. Okay. The curriculum for males includes Spanish history, Latin, philo Latin philosophy, canon, civil law, and rhetoric. Okay. So, yan yung mga curriculum at yan yung mga pinag-aaralan ng mga kalalakihan during the 19th century. Okay. So, as you can see, pinag-aralan nilang Spanish history kahit na Pilipino sila. Okay? Hindi mawawala yan. Now, for female in secondary education, ito yung mga school exclusively for girls. Colegios of Santa Potenciana, founded in 1591. Santa Isabel, founded in 1632. Santa Catalina de Sana, founded in 1696. Santa Rita College, founded in 1719. Colegio de la Inmaculada Concepcion Concordia, founded in 1868. So, yeah, the curriculum for females includes rules of courtesy, vocal music, language, and sewing. So, as you can see, wala silang subject na magkapareho, magkaiba talaga. Ang uh, curriculum ng male and female during this period, Okay. The educational system is also used to pacify the Filipinos and train them in Catholicism and to follow laws imposed by the Spaniards. Okay? So, during this period, ang mga uh, Pilipinong estudyante, hindi sila pinapayagan na gamitin yung sarili nilang dialect sa school and yung mga school buildings and other facilities during this time, hindi siya sapat sa populasyon ng mga estudyante noon dahil napakaraming estudyante. And the Department of Education during the Spanish could not also provide enough books and other instructional materials needed for the quality education. Okay? So, in short, hindi sapat yung instruction, uh, learning instructional materials ng mga estudyante during this period. Okay? Hindi sapat. So, the parochial schools were established with the Spanish missionaries as the teachers. So, basically, the Spanish missionaries sila yung mga naging Teacher. So, sila yung magde-decide kung ano yung ituturo nila sa school. And then, during this period, uh, ang pinag-aaralan nila or yung technique or teaching strategy, strategy during this period ay uh, more on rote or memorization lang. So, ang mga bata, uh, pinapamemorize sa kanila yung mga contents ng libro kahit na hindi nila naiintindihan. Okay? Okay. So, the students were taught in native dialects, although there was a law requiring the children to be taught in Spanish, okay? So, meron pa rin law na nagre-require sa mga bata na ituro sa kanila yung Spanish, okay? However, uh, the Spaniards were hesitant during this time na 
uh, turuan ng Spanish ang mga estudyante ang mga bata. Why? Because uh, naniniwala sila na kapag ang isang Pilipino ay tinuruan mo na tinuruan ng Spanish, uh, ito'y magiging way para mag uh, uh, i-oppose nila or uh, tumiwalag sila sa pamahalaan ng Espanya. Okay? So, religion was the most important subject, okay? As we mentioned earlier, Catholicism, dahil sa kagustuhan nilang ipalaganapin ang Katolisismo sa Pilipinas. At the end of the Spanish period, the University of Santo Tomas was the only institution of university level in Manila. It was established in 1611 solely for the Spaniards and Mestizos. So, the University of Santo Tomas, siya yung kauna-unahang university sa Pilipinas and in Asia. And siya yung pinaka-oldest university na nag exist even up to this day. Okay? So, itong University of Santo Tomas, it opened its doors to Filipino students. Okay? Uh, kahit si Rizal, dito rin siya nakapag-aral and other heroes, had come to study in University of Santo Tomas. Okay? Now, we have this Educational Decree of 1863, okay, na pinatupad noong December 20, 1863. So, anong nilalaman ng Educational De Decree of 1863? Okay, ganito yan. Uh, Ang, ang point nito is bawat uh, town or bawat lugar sa Pilipinas kailangan magkaroon ng kahit isang uh, primary school exclusive for boys and another for girls. And ang medium ng instruction ay Spanish. Okay? So, uh, yan ang nilalaban ng Educational Decree of 1863. But, uh, the friars did not implement this decree because Ayun, as, we men uh, as I mentioned earlier, they believe that if the Filipinos will be educated, it might be inspired by new ideas of freedom and independence as well as justice. So, in short, ayaw nilang matuto ang mga Pilipino ng Spanish kasi ito yung magiging way para i-oppose nila yung administration ng, ng Spaniards, okay? So, we also have the Moret Decree of 1870. Okay, intended to secularize higher education in the colony, but the friars opposed the idea of the government's control over education. Okay, ayan, kontrabida na naman dito ang friars. Ayaw na naman nilang ipatupad ito. Dahil nga, sa paniniwala nila, na belief nila, na pag natuto ang mga bata ng, Spanya, ng Spanish or natutunan nila, nagkaroon sila ng kaalaman, ah, uh, Ito yung magiging way para tumiwalag ang mga Pilipino, okay? Magkaroon ng revolusyon sa Pilipinas, okay? At yun yung ayaw nilang mangyari. Okay, next, let's proceed to the economic condition of the Philippines during the 19th century. Okay. Uh, pagkatapos ng establishment ng Spanish government sa Manila, Ang pinaka-challenge ngayon kay Miguel Lopez de Legazpi ay kung paano niya kukontrolin yung iba't ibang parte ng Pilipinas na mayroon lamang siyang uh, limited armies. Okay, to solve the issue of governance, ito ginawa niya. Legazpi converted the land of the Indios into the encomienda. Okay, what is this encomienda? The word encomienda comes from the Spanish encomendar which means to entrust, ipagkatiwala. The encomienda is a grant of inhabitants living in a particular conquered territory which Spain gave to a Span Spanish colonizer as a reward for his services. Okay, now there are three types of encomienda. We have royal, ecclesiastical, and privado. Royal, ito yung mga tax na mapupunta sa King of Spain. Ecclesiastical, taxes na mapupunta sa church. Privado, the encomienda given to the friend of the king who had contribution for the colonization. So, what are the duties or responsibilities of encomendero? The encomendero, first, he had the right to collect taxes. Okay? Yun yung una. Pangalawa, uh, he had the right to monitor the peace and order and govern the parcel of land given to him. Okay? However, ang encomendero... He is not allowed to live inside his encomienda or dun sa, uh, sa community niya to avoid the direct communication to the natives living in the encomienda para walang communication na mangyari, okay? So, ang 
ang masakit na part dito is that the natives who are the real owners of the land uh, became slaves in their own properties. Imagine that. Pag-aari mo pero ikaw ay naging alipin sa sarili mong uh, uh, property. Okay? Naging alipin ng mga natives during this period. Uh, aside from that, uh, they were also subjected to taxation. So, pinagbabayad din sila ng tax. Okay? Later on, they abolish the encomienda and convert the land into haciendas. Okay. Now, let's proceed to haciendas owned by the friars and Spanish officials. The Spanish friars belong to different religious orders were the richest landlords for they owned the best haciendas, uh, specific, specifically agricultural lands in the Philippines. So, yung mga natives who had been living in these haciendas and uh, nag-effort na i-cultivate yung, mga, uh, yung, uh, uh, yung lupain nila, sila yung naging tenant sa nung time na to, okay? So, naturally, they resented the loss of their lands which belong to their ancestors since pre-Spanish times. Uh, legally, however, uh, the friars were recognized as legal owners of said lands because they obtained royal titles of ownership from the Spanish crown. Legally speaking, yung lupa na yun ay pagmamayari ng mga friars. But in reality, pag-aari yun ng mga natives, okay? So, yun yung ikinasama ng loob ng mga natives during this time, okay? So, ito rin yung naging way para magkaroon ng revolt, okay? Tenant revolts uh, during this time, okay? Now, let's proceed to the abuses of Guardia Civil, church officials, and political leaders. Guardia Civil the last hated symbol of Spanish tyranny which was created by the royal decree of February 12, 1852. Okay. Uh, it was amended by another royal decree on March 24, 1888 for the purpose of maintaining internal peace and order in the Philippines. And it was patterned after the famous and well-disciplined Guardia Civil in Spain. Uh, Dr. Jose Rizal himself and his mother had been victims of the brutalities of Guardia, Guardia Civil also. So, uh, naging kilala tong mga Guardia Civil na to because of their abuses, okay, such as maltreating innocent people, looting their carabaos, chickens, and valuable belongings. And the worst thing about this is that uh, raping helpless women, okay? Okay, now let's proceed to the different socioeconomic policies imposed by the Spaniards. First, we have reduction. The natives are forced to live in the place near the center and they could hear the sound of the bell. Okay, this policy was implemented so that the government and parish priests could easily monitor the natives and for the easy conversion to Catholicism. So, ayun. Uh, tinipon-tipon lahat ng natives at uh, nilagay sila sa center ng community. And dito maririnig nila yung tunog ng kampana or the sound of bell. And ang, ang reason dito ng uh, government uh, to easily monitor the natives and easy conversion to Catholicism. The program of Father Juan de Placencia lead to the creation of the center which is composed of the church, my church, of course, the municipal hall, uh, plaza, market and school for each town. So, yun yung uh, mga establishments na meron sa community or napapaligiran yung isang community ng mga eto, mga nasab nabanggit ko kanina. Okay, next, bandala. The natives are obliged to sell their products to the Spaniards. Okay. So, sa pilitang pagbebenta ng mga natives ng mga produkto na uh, naani nila and ang Masakit na part dito is bibili yung mga produkto nila sa napakababang halaga ng mga Spaniards. And the worst thing about this is sometimes the Spaniards will just issue some promissory notes. Magbibigyan na lang sila ng promissory notes na wala silang binigay na bayad man lang kahit magkano. Okay? And the third one is polo is servicios. Ito yung forced labor sa lahat ng Filipino males from 16 to 60 years old for 40 days periods, okay? So, ano ba yung madalas na pinapagawa sa kanila? For example, uh, community projects like construction, repair of infrastructure, church construction, or uh, cutting logs in the forest for 40 days, okay? 
The word polo refers to community work. So, ito yung tawag sa work. And the laborer was called polista. There is one way for a uh, Filipino male not to join the polo service. So, ano yun? Kailangan niya magbayad ng fala. Ito yung fala. Ito yung uh, tawag dun sa bayad para ma-exclude or hindi ka ma uh, ma-exclude ka dun sa pagre-render ng service or forced labor. In 1884, the 40 days of forced labor was reduced to 15 days, so nabawasan siya noong 1884. So, what are the effects of polo iservisios? First, uh, the decrease in the production in agriculture, okay, bumaba yung production na mga produkto na naani, okay? Because nataon na uh, yung mga kalalakihan nun ay may ginagawang trabaho at the same time kailangan ng planting at her at during that time uh, planting and harvesting period na but itong karamihan sa mga lalaki ay nagre-render ng work sa ibang uh, sa ibang uh, aspect okay for example yung nabanggit natin kanina na construction ganyan uh, cutting logs dun sila naka-focus instead dun sa planting and harvesting kaya eventually uh, bumaba ang production. Pangalawa, bumaba rin ang populasyon. Why? Because maraming namatay na polista or mga laborer dahil sa manual work. Okay? And pangatlo, nagkaroon ng rebellion. Okay? Rebellion of the natives. So, yun yung mga naging epekto ng polo e services. Okay, next. The taxation. The natives are paying different types of taxes such as follows. So, ito. May apat na tax na binabayaran ang mga uh, natives. First is the cedula. Male and female, 18 years old and above, will pay every year for cedula. So, walang exemption dito. As long as 18 years old ka na, kailangan mo magbayad. Okay? Sanctorum. Ito yung uh, tax na babayaran mo pa na mapupunta sa church. And donativo de Zamboanga. A tax, a tax specifically used for the conquest of Holo. So, uh, ito yung tax na binabayad to finance the war in Mindanao against the Muslims. So, may war na nangyayari sa Mindanao during this period. Okay? So, tribute, it may be paid in cash or in kind. When we say in kind, uh, pwede mong bayaran uh, through, for example, fruits. I-offer mo fruits o di kaya mag-offer ka ng rice. Ganun. So, tumatanggap pa rin sila. It's either cash or in kind. Okay? Next, the tribute, buwis or the tributo. Uh, Miguel Lopez de Legazpi was the first to order the payment of tribute. His successors followed this practice. So, si Legazpi ang kauna-unahang nagpatupad ng pagbabayad ng tribute okay, sa mga natives. The tribute or buwis was collected from the natives both in cash, gold or money, and in kind uh, such as rice, cloth, chicken, coconut oil, abaca, and of thinking capacity. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, pwedeng in cash or in kind. And ito yung mga example niya. Okay, next. The king of Spain preferred the payment of gold but the natives paid largely in kind. So, ang mga natives noon hindi naman ganun kayaman. Wala rin naman silang pera. So, majority of them, uh, they paid uh, largely in kind. So, that's why the king uh, was annoyed or nainis siya. Dahil nga, most of the tributes na natukokolekta ay in kind na natatanggap. Okay? Now, we're done to last one. Galleon trade. Okay, this trading policy changed the system of free trading in the Philippines wherein the other nationalists like the Chinese are free to exchange their goods with the Filipinos who had extra good. So, sa galleon trade, ito yung nag-open up sa iba't ibang bansa para uh, magkaroon ng mga produkto na wala sa isang bansa. For example, yung mangoes natin sa Pilipinas, uh, in-export natin sa ibang bansa na limitado yung mangoes nila. For, uh, and vice versa rin yun. Okay? Kung ano yung wala sa atin na produkto, kukunin natin sa ibang bansa. At kung ano yung meron sa atin, kung ano yung uh, sobra-sobrang produkto na meron tayo, i-offer uh, natin sa ibang bansa. Okay? So, yun ang galeon trade. Okay? And the trading system which existed in 1565 until 1815 and trading route from Canton in China, Acapulco in Mexico, and Manila. Okay? And in the policy pala, in the policy of galleon trade, uh, ang merchant 
o isang mga lakal, makapag-participate lamang siya sa trading kung makapagbayad siya ng boletas. Ano tong boletas? It's the ticket for the galleon trade. Okay? So, what are the effects of the galleon trade? First, the decrease in the productive of the native industry because the alcalde mayors who were part of the trading imposed the planting of coconut and abaca fibers. The farmers who could not meet the imposed quota will need to pay a heavy fine. That's the first effect. Second, the loss of profit of the local industry. And then the third one, the intercultural exchanges between the Philippines and Mexico. The products of Mexico like cocoa, sayote, teams, etc. entered the country while the mango of the Philippines, rice, and textiles were able to reach Mexico. Okay? So, uh, yan ang mga nag epekto ng galleon trade. So, that's it for this chapter. Uh, chapter 2, the Philippine condition during the 19th century as results context. So, I hope you learned something today. If you have, uh, if you have uh, any questions or further questions, uh, kindly message me personally, especially sa mga studyante ko. Okay? Kung may clarifications kayo or gusto kayong idagdal, message nyo ako personally sa account ko. And I hope uh, nakatulong itong video presentation natin para maintindihan nyo yung uh, lessons natin. Okay? So thank you for watching and see you on the next video.